We're going to move on to our next speaker. Uh, Dr. Odette Harris is a professor of neurosurgery and director of brain injury at Stanford University School of Medicine. She is also the deputy chief of staff for rehabilitation, including TBI, polytrauma, SCID, BRS, and PMNR. Um, Dr. Harris is the director of the Defense Veterans Brain Injury Center, and we'll talk this morning on gender and concussion. Dr. Harris. Thank you for um, giving me the opportunity to speak. A lot of what I'm going to say actually segues nicely um, after uh, Dr. Pines. Um, this work is heavily supported by the uh, Defense and Veterans Brain Injury Center. Um, and as he pointed out, um, how we view concussion and brain injury and blast injury, et cetera, is, is sort of entwined in this. Um, so I'm actually talking about gender and the effects of polytrauma. Polytrauma is what we have co-opted as a term in reference to uh, brain injury. Um, and it's uh, in, if you are outside of the military or the VA, um, you think of polytrauma as multiple injuries. But uh, within that context, since the conflicts began, uh, polytrauma means that you have um, an injury. You could have multiple injuries, but the primary injury and the driving force of those injuries is your traumatic brain injury. Um, so, it's, so that's what we'll be using here. So today I was just going to, I don't know how much I'll get through. Hopefully I'll get through the bulk of this. I've been asked to talk about gender specific to this. And so it's going to be gender in the context of blast injury and brain injury in the military. Um, the reason that I'm doing this work is largely because I actually live in the both worlds that he talked about. I'm both... Um, uh, in the acute management, so I manage traumatic brain injury from the acute side as a neurosurgeon, and then um, from recovery to reintegration, so all the way through. And then I work both at Stanford, and then obviously my work is supported by DOD, and uh, do research at the VA as well, and work at the VA. So the whole gamut of civilian, military, um, acute, all the way to reentry. So that's what uh, informs this work. So in the beginning, we knew very little about traumatic brain injury from blast. Um, and so uh, this was this took us by surprise, obviously, when we went into conflicts and all of a sudden people were surviving. And I think many of you probably remember the news surrounding this. And uh, TBI quickly became the signature wound. Um, but our expertise were fairly limited as a, as a, as a nation. Um, and then also our rehab units, um, our recovery units were also limited. Um, brain injury was very isolated and was not integrated. Um, and so this was an issue when obviously everybody was now talking about this. People were coming back in significant numbers, and they were surviving because of the armor that they now had. But um, So they were able to systemically survive, but they were suffering some significant brain injuries. And this became a challenge for us to not only manage, but to understand, to research, and to hopefully prevent, treat, etc. And so we evolved. We evolved a system of care, both not only on the um, DOD side, but also on the VA side. And this became a, a, a comprehensive effort. MOUs were signed, and this care was centralized within the VA. Um, set up a, a whole host of different programs and areas of expertise, geomapping, et cetera. And as you can see from this, we have both our comprehensive rehab centers, then the, the DVBIC um, began in as far back as 1992, but then became co-localized with the these polytrauma centers that were obviously focused on brain injury. And then we um, uh, subspecialized into different programs specific to all the things that we were learning as we go. So basically building the, the plane while we were in mid-flight. Um, so you had like the emerging consciousness program, the network sites, the transitional sites, et cetera. Um, and the mission again became focused on really providing the best care that we can, but being driven by the brain injury itself. And so the brain injury be informed the constellation of care that developed. And so we evolved, we evolved into this system. And this system actually, if you were to overlay the map of the DVBIC sites. On these sites, you'll see uh, a lot of synergy there. The red dots are the main sites. And as you can see, the red dot uh, over in California, that's us at, in Palo Alto, combined with Stanford. And we have both a polytrauma site and a DIMPIC site uh, for that reason. And we're um, doing research uh, related to that. And then our rehab units changed as well, because that became the crux of surviving um, and treating these patients. And it went from this sort of isolated model to this completely integrated model, where we now treat every aspect of, of the concomitant injuries that one would suffer, in addition to the brain injury driving it. And so we've developed very specified uh, units and centers and uh, uh, pathways of care, et cetera, all focused on the overall and a comprehensive recovery of someone who suffered blast injury. 
And there's from this, there's been a significant amount of research. Um, this is a very interesting area to study. We didn't know a lot about blast injury, obviously. And so everyone started thinking about this, studying this. We've been at conflict now for over a decade. So there's a lot of research that's been done. Um, and this is all called uh, polytrauma, and multiple names are ascribed to it, OEF, OIF, OND. Um, so lots of research have come out. And from this, we've gathered uh, a very sort of the foundation for understanding this. What we know is that the majority, as you pointed out, sort of a similar slide, but even going further back, um, is, is not changed. It's mild traumatic brain injury. We know that the published research really focuses on that. There's been a lot of descriptive analysis, a lot of meta-analysis that have been performed, and they kind of shape our understanding of this cohort. We understand the prevalence. We think we understand the comorbidities, the impact in terms of functional outcomes, and Overall, we feel we have a broad understanding of the descriptive analysis of this Kali trauma cohort. But the question is, are these conclusions applicable to everyone? And that became a major concern for us. We wanted to understand, are these conclusions applicable when we break them down into subtypes, specifically women? And from this, um, the way this came about, rather, was that, um, you know, we think we understand this cohort, but it's 95 plus male. There are some studies that completely or entirely men, and yet we then take that data and we extrapolate it to every single sub-cohort without thinking about whether or not they're applicable. Now, you might ask, why am I concerned about this? Well, as a field in medicine, we've done this before. Right? Many of you are familiar with the Framingham study. This was a study that was done um, in the 1948, over 5,000 adults, Framingham, Massachusetts. Um, this is the foundation for much of what we know about the concept of risk factors. It's foundational to medicine. The work has been astronomical and very influential in how we proceed. Yet Framingham, if you want to really break it down, is an entirely... Um, was completely representative of the, the world that we live in today. Um, it was consisted almost entirely of white, middle-class Euro-Americans. There were no blacks, no Latinas, no Asians. And you might think this is irrelevant because we're talking about medicine, but in fact, it actually is very irrelevant. Some of the recommendations that came out of Framingham were not only not effective in some sub-cohorts, but they were actually deleterious in some sub-cohorts. So if you take, for those of you who are um, internists or family specialists, if you take the recommendations that came out of Framingham, for antihypertensives, as an example, when applied as a first line to the African American population, it's actually deleterious to some, right? And yet, um, you know, that's what we learned. These were the landmark studies, and we never substratified. Um, we then, years later, did the, what is this, the Framingham Heart Study focused on blacks, right? But this is like publishing on page six after you've had a headliner, and many people learned the, the, the algorithms that were put forth from this study, and many people did not go back to kind of try to figure out what has changed, what do we now need to know. And so what I was concerned about was in the context of all the data that I was just showing, all the research, this being sort of a very quote unquote popular um, area to research, is that were we doing the same thing for the subcohorts that were being affected by traumatic brain injury? Were we going down and creating algorithms and management strategies and treatment protocols that were really representative for sure of the whole cohort, but when applied to smaller cohorts like women, right? And we haven't even touched on um, ethnic minorities, but just when applied to like women, right? Would those be deleterious? Would they have the same impact? Would they have the same efficacy? And so that became our concern. I wanted to not go back down that same rabbit hole. And so we decided, and, and our studies were really kind of trying to say that women are represented in the data set are noise, right? Because if you have 3%, 4%, it becomes very difficult to really understand the experience of those subcohorts. And there's a potential there for gender bias. And the demographics, you know, we were concerned, was it comparable? So women in the military, just to quickly go through this in the interest of time, 8% of all living veterans, but um, they're experiencing combat more than ever in previous eras, um, and they're more likely to obtain their health um, in the VA than other um, uh, eras of veterans. And so understanding this becomes very important. There are also some unique stressors that are applied to women, um, not only in the military, but also in general, but specific to the military. Um, there's the issue of uh, military sexual assault as well. We don't know how that influences some of the healthcare outcomes in this scenario. Um, and so we, we really wanted to better understand this cohort. I'm going to skip through that slide. 
Nationally, it's about 3 to 5 percent. At our institution um, and uh, at the, the Palo Alto VA and the Dimbic site, when we look at women, we have a larger cohort. We have about 6 percent. Um, the, so we're somewhat uh, a big site in that regard. Um, and when we looked at this, um, I will say that one of the ways that um, that we tried to approach it was to look at what was happening in the um, what was happening in our system first of all. And so we first wanted to say, did we have biases in our decision making? Um, did we have biases in who we accepted into our programs? What was happening? Um, and so we uh, underwent something called a validity assessment. And in that, we found that 12 percent of women versus seven. Um, sorry, we found that seven percent of women were accepted. 12 percent were re directed. That actually was statistically significant when compared to our male cohorts seeking admissions into our program. And this led us to understand that we did in fact have some biases. When we sub-analyzed sub the data, what we found was that a larger percentage of women had comorbidities with spinal cord injury and traumatic brain injury, so we were referring them to the spinal cord injury programs, which is valid, but did cause some bias and bias uh, on the on the face of it in terms of our referral patterns, and that led to a further question as to why do women have more spinal cord injuries and concomitant TBIs than men post blast, and that's a topic for another talk that hopefully there's a summit on that as well, um, and I'll be back, but um, but it also taught us that. The numbers are so small that if you have a cohort of five women and one is re-referred, your numbers are going to be skewed as well. And then we also saw that there were some differences in the acute mental health issues. So that led us to go deep. Um, and so in the literature, um, just to, again, hopefully I'm not running out of time, in the literature you'll find that women fare differently than men when it came to psychiatric, but the overall impact was really quite largely unknown because we had never actually stratified the data to just look at women. We were looking at this larger cohort, and our methodologies that we applied were not specific enough to pick this up. So we went deeper with support by the Defense and Veterans Brain Injury Center, as I said, Clayman Institute, which for those of you at Stanford is the largest largest gender-based institute in the country, um, and then uh, support from the VA as well. And we decided to look at this. And our hypothesis was really just simple. Like, are women wholly represented in the published outcomes that inform our data-driven decisions when it comes to traumatic brain injury? Very straightforward. Are we understanding this cohort, and are the recommendations valid? And so we went back and we looked, and I won't take you through the pain of it all, but um, we matched, we looked at the data, we wanted to better understand, we pulled out the um, injury characteristics, and we looked at the domains that were being represented in the literature itself. So we weren't creating this, this is what everyone was reporting on, psychiatric diagnosis, post-concussive um, symptoms, neurobehavioral symptoms. And then we compared that to, um, to the VA, to our cohort of women, and what you'll see is that women tended to be be um, more likely to be unemployed, less likely to be working, more likely to be homeless. But look up to education, more likely to be educated and at a higher level of education. So this turns on its head everything we understand or think we understand about unemployment, homelessness, and the strategies that we then deploy to apply to that. So for instance, if you are homeless and unemployed, we think school. Education, right? And this was a discussion that we had at the Department of, of Labor where we were sort of saying, this is not the case necessarily for women. There are going to be other factors perhaps that we are unaware of that is driving their unemployment and not necessarily education as it is in the general cohort. Then we went to psychiatric diagnosis and substance abuse, and you can see the numbers there. We talk a lot about PTSD, for which women do suffer, a substantial uh, numbers of them suffer from PTSD. Um, but you can also see that there are high numbers of depression, there are high numbers of, of, um, of substance abuse and cognitive impairments. Um, and then if you go and you look at post-concussive symptoms, you'll see again that uh, women have higher numbers um, in several of chronic pain, et cetera. So trying to direct our attention to where those differences are when they're compared to the general cohort. And this was really interesting to us. For those of you who've cared for these patients and you neuro neurobehavioral symptoms, the, the um, vestibular and somatosensory symptoms are definitely the most um, aggravating of the comorbidities, or the morbidities, rather. And you'll see that for women, somatosensory and vestibular tend to be significantly higher than that of their male cohort as well. 
So if you look at this, you'll see that women have a lower percentage of, uh, tend to be a lower percentage of working, more likely to be homeless, right? More often diagnosed with the following uh, symptoms than their male cohorts, more likely to report chronic pain and other symptoms, and more likely to suffer the somatosensory and vestibular symptoms than their male cohorts. And in understanding this, we are better able to target the interventions that would come from this. And so spending all of our time on just PTSD might not be valuable for a cohort that it includes women. Um, thinking more about depression, thinking more about the somatosensory symptoms might actually be more impacting in getting them to recovery. Um, so we've published on this, we've been featured on this, we've presented this at the Pentagon, we've presented this at the Department of Labor. And from this, one of the things that we realized was that we actually needed more data, right? More and more data. And the field is going this. People are understanding that gender does indeed matter when we're looking at this. The IOM report, which came out in 2013, underscored that these disparities needed to be addressed. But I think what they did further, which I appreciate, was that they understood that the methodologies had to change. Because when you're dealing with really small numbers in a cohort, you cannot apply the same uh, practices to, under, to, to studying them. Um, they, they recommended things like oversampling the uh, populations and, and so on and so forth, but also developing policies that, are, that recognize these differences as they exist. And so we still think that we need more data. I'm going to start talking about some of the more data that we've, we've gone into, and then when it's time, just let me know, and I'll, I'll stop. Um, and so we thought we would go back, because when we looked at, we were actually in that first part of the study um, just comparing what was in the literature to our experience of having one of the larger representations of women in the country in the military. So we were trying to see how does that compare to what everyone else thinks that is happening with this cohort. But then um, I want to give recognition to my senior scientist in the audience, Dr. Addison. We went back and said, okay, maybe now we can do a matched analysis and try to better understand um, where do we stand in the chronic symptoms? Where do we stand if we're looking at same age, same demographics, same everything? So now drilling down on the data as opposed to just looking at what's in the literature. And so we wanted to understand this. We did a matched analysis, matching on admission, time of injury, mechanism. And again, we looked, we wanted to compare apples to apples. So we went back to the same domains that we had evaluated before. And uh, this is the NSI, the four composite symptoms that we uh, looked at. And what we found was that from vestibular standpoint and cognitive standpoint, those actually persisted. Those differences persisted. Women, in fact, did have a higher reporting of those symptoms. The other symptoms, however, did not reach significant. But it does support our concern that perhaps some of these symptoms might actually be driving the results that we're seeing in terms of the impact on uh, uh, functional outcome and the impact on things like reintegration as measured by homelessness or as measured by returning to work. So consistent with our overall results. And when we looked at reintegration indices like living and employment, employment did not bear out, but living in fact did. And the homelessness, which is a component of that factor, did in fact show that women were disproportionately homeless as well. And so overall, these findings were consistent with the previous findings. We are seeing something in terms of neurobehavioral symptom inventory, and we are seeing differences in terms of reintegration. And so the outcomes that we observed, again, are different. The differences are, not, are, are, the differences are solely in the functional domains. And so our next step was, are there differences in the physical and anatomical domains? Is there something else there that's happening? Is there a differential impact? And I have to say that we ventured into these waters very warily. Um, a, lot of, a lot of times this work is misquoted. Um, women can't handle combat. Women are um, not going to do well if you put them into combat. They're going to have, they're not going to recover well, etc. So you could imagine venturing into the domain of trying to establish perhaps anatomical differences would be questionable. Um, but our, our, our goal was um, the science, to truly understand. Like, because here we are making decisions, making algorithms, allocating a lot of funds, right? And as you know, research begets research. And so if we're not studying it, then the, the, the other side that's studying it, um, putting out data that said, this is how you treat the cohort, more and more data comes out. And, and our fear was that uh, it might be deleterious to those who are being impacted by these injuries. So we ventured in. 
And we wanted to understand the relationship between functional outcome, executive function, and any kind of anatomical differences. And uh, Dr. Addison chose first to look at cortical thickness and diffusion properties. And we sampled, you can see our methodology there, we looked at 56 civilians and veterans, and we tried to characterize um, what that would look like from an anatomical standpoint using those cortical thickness and, and diffusion tensor. Um, now, I'm not an expert in neuroradiography, in, in, sorry, neuroimaging. Um, we have several in the field, and Dr. Zina is going to speak next, and Dr. Adamson's in the audience. But I will kind of briefly just take you through what we did find. What we found was that the gender differences um, is consistent in what we observed in healthy adults. So that post-injury, we were not finding those differences. Um, and, and, and the more, actually, the more data that we get, the clearer that becomes. Early in our analysis, we actually thought that we had some differences there. But we're now founding that, finding that there are differences, but those differences existed pre-morbid. All right, and I think that's actually really solid information to understand. And again, no differences in the DTI either. Um, so no statistical differences and no correlation found between the structural brain measures and executive function. But we also recognize that this is only one component of anatomy, right? We're not saying that there are absolutely no anatomical differences. This is where we started, and this is what we have found thus far. And so the anatomy tells us that the brain differences related to gender that exist, again, are the same pre and post, that, the gen that there are no differences in the white matter, no relationship found between the brain anatomy and the executive function. And so taking a step back, where we started, our hypothesis that, you know, do women, are women being represented wholly in the data sets that we are basing our treatment algorithms, further research, our management strategies, and our resource allocation, right? Are women fully represented? Do we understand them? Are there differences? Um, and that we evaluated the field and the published literature versus our experience, and we were able to find that, in fact, there are significant gaps. There are specific differences in the experience that women post-traumatic brain injury, post-blast injury, have a statistically significant difference when compared to their male cohorts and the cohort as a whole. Then we went to a second level evaluation where we wanted to more specifically compare individuals per individuals matching them to take out further noise, and those data were supported. We found in our cross-sectional and matched analysis that the NSI and the reintegration indices did in fact show differences for women versus men. And then we looked at the brain anatomy, trying to correlate that with executive function, and there, looking at the three areas that we chose to focus on, we did not find concordance. All right, so in summary, our symptom reporting is indexed, and I can't believe I made it in time. Right? Our symptoms indexed by NSI that there are, some, there are differences. Our reintegration ind um, indices, there are differences. And that the brain anatomy tells us that there potentially are differences, but right now um, on the indices that we're looking at, uh, there are no differences there. Um, and we really believe that we need more data, right? We need to focus more on this. We need to go deeper. And so this is just a, like a roadmap to where we intend to go and how we are moving along. But we recognize that the tools have to be nuanced. Right, You can't just look at a cohort, pull out the noise, and expect it to be the same. You have to apply advanced methodological tools. Number one, you have to care to look. Right, You have to understand that when there are small cohorts, sub-cohorts, that there might indeed be differences, like, um, and that you have to build on our understanding of, of, of epidemiology and build on our previous understanding of what happens when we don't pay attention, and that these strategies are not always benign, that they can, in fact, not only be ineffective, but deleterious, and we really have to pay attention to that. And um, and I will say that this does, in fact, have major implications because it allows us, what, what had happened in the past without focusing on this was that the resource allocation to women was almost nothing, right? And so now we're actually getting attention. This has really led to um, uh, uh, increased resources so that we can actually go deeper into the anatomy and a deeper understanding. Um, we think a more comprehensive model is, is needed. We do not believe that the tools that we are using now are sufficient. And so that's where we're headed um, in trying to better understand this. Again, data begets data, so we really need to be careful. For those of you who are scientists in the audience, we really need to understand what we are purporting to our patients and translating to the bedside. So 
ask yourself, are the conclusions applicable to everyone? Are the conclusions specifically applicable to the sub-cohorts you are treating? For many of you, that will be women in the military. And that we're actually dealing with real lives. We're not just dealing with theories. Like, we have seen this happen. We've seen the impact on the women that we care for. And so there's the sign that says stop, and so I will. And I will thank uh, my supporters, some of whom are in the audience, um, and, and, and those listed on the field. So thank you, and I'll open to questions. If you have.